So now I want to calculate the displacements associated with my redundant loading too. And I want the displacement at three meters and six meters of this drawing right here. And so I will take this. So here is my drawing for redundant loading X2. It's just the six meter long cantilever beam with X2 applied at the end. And if I wanted to, I could solve for reactions, which would be boom, X2 downwards like this and a moment like this of six meters times X2. But for this one, I'm gonna go ahead and use some charts. So if I look inside the back of a book or I Google it or something, I will see often a cantilever beam like this with a length L, and then I will see probably something with a loading P, and maybe even a coordinate system that will say V and X like this. And if you look at these charts, you will, sh you will see that this V is equal to, and you know, these are, are pretty convenient to use, but they're always, they're always susceptible to a bunch of simple mistakes, you know, like sign convention, forgetting the negative sign, especially when your load is pointing in opposite direction, and then understanding the location. This is one of the simpler equations, so it's not as bad. And there's always also sometimes a, a maximum deflection that's also given to you, this delta max, and in this case, it occurs at the tip of the cantilever at x equals l, and this would be PL cubed over 3EI. And so if you put L into X here, you would find this PL cubed over 3EI. And you'll also notice that this delta max right here, this is just a magnitude. It does not give direction, all right? So that's something very important to make sure you, you take care of or you pay attention to. And here, this provides direction. And this negative makes sure that this point goes down at the tip whereas positive displacements would be going up, okay? All right, so for our case, in this case, if we wanna use the charts to find the displacements at three meters and six meters of this beam, so the thing I wanna do is I'm just gonna plug and chug, and, and I'm gonna use this relationship here, and this is gonna be, now instead of the, I have to put, if you will, because my, co my concentrated load is pointing up, whereas this equation was for a concentrated load pointing down, I've gotta substitute for P a negative X2, and a negative times a negative makes it positive. So I have a capital X2 positive in this case, three meters squared times three times six meters minus at X of three meters, divided by six E I. And when I substitute and I solve, I will get a positive 22.5 meters cubed over E I. Then I, for the last point right here, at this point right here, at the tip of the cantilever, I know it's my max location. I could use the same equation, plug in X equals six, and I'd be done. Or I could just use this relationship here and this will tell me that my displacement at the edge or at the tip of the cantilever at six meters is x2 times six meters cubed over three ei, which is 72 meters cubed over ei times x2. Boom. And these are my last two displacements. And I'm gonna take these and substitute them way back in my compatibility equation right here, boom and boom. And now I have values for everything and now I can solve these two equations at the same time and solve for my redundant loads. All right, so now I'm ready to substitute and solve for my forces and moments, but in this case, it's just forces because the redundance that I chose were just force redundance. And here are my compatibility equations. I'm gonna substitute the displacements that I had or that I found. So for this first equation up here, which I will use black. And my second compatibility equation, if I substitute, will look like this. And here are my two equations with the displacement substituted into it. You may notice something here, how this 22.5 is the same as this 22.5, and there's some sense of symmetry. And if I set this up in a matrix formulation, so if I take these, you can already notice that all the EIs will cancel, but I'll, I'll keep them for now. But here, if I take these two, displacements associated with my primary structure and I bring them to the right, my, my equations, if I can set up a matrix formulation that looks like this. 
So here's my matrix formulation, and, and this symmetric matrix is my flexibility matrix. So these, each of these are my flexibility coefficients in this flexibility matrix, and this I could describe as, ah, uh, this is flex of F11, or row one, column one, this F12, row one, column two, and here I could call this one F21, row two, column one, and F22 row two, column two. And the way that this flexibility coefficient is described is the displacement at location one due to a unit load at location two. So if I wanted to show what these flexibility coefficients are graphically, I would, you know, I would go back to this, you know, superposition drawings that I have for my redundance and my primary loading, and I would draw the display shape here. This is the display shape generally looks something like this, and here the display shape for this looks something like this, right here. And if I want to describe what is this flexibility coefficient f12, which is the displacement at location one due to a unit load at location two. And so here, the displacement that we're talking about would be this displacement at location one due to a unit load at location two, right here. And this displacement, I'll just call it the magnitude of this displacement, is F12 times X2. And if X2 were one, we would just have the flexibility coefficient. And then this displacement right here, the magnitude of this would be F2. 2, 2 times x2. This flexibility coefficient f2, 2 is the displacement at location 2 due to a unit load at location 2. And if we multiply it by the load, then we'll get the actual displacement. And here, this right here would be, as you can imagine, f11 times x1. And this would be f21 times x1. One. And those are our flexibility coefficients. That's what it looks like. In any case, hopefully that gives you a sense of some matrix analysis. We call this a force method because normally we, we end up solving for forces first as opposed to displacements. And, and now when you go ahead and you solve this, you can use any calculator, any fancy schmancy calculator that you got. And here, for x1, we get 20.57 kilonewtons. And we get a positive answer for that. And for x2, we get 7.07 .07 kilonewtons and also a positive answer for that, which means that the direction that we drew it in is good, all right, that we originally drew it in. And this, if you recall, x1 was by, x2 was cy right here, and we initially drew them pointing upwards in our original free body diagram. And so that means BY is 20.57 kilonewtons upwards, and CY is 7.07 .07 kilonewtons upwards. And now, now that we have these two reactions, we can go through and solve using our equilibrium equations, AY, AX, and MA, and then draw our shear and moment diagrams.